Erev Tov Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Today I've got a wonderful uh, insight from the Holy Spirit, the Lord revealing to me an astounding prophecy about the United States found in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, and it's not to say that maybe someone else has already realized and made the connection to the prophecies by Habakkuk in the United States. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't, but it was something that God began to deal with me on today, and I wanted to come and share with you exactly the way the Lord laid it out in my heart. And ironically, uh, the way this prophecy lays out is just so eerily odd because uh, President Barack Obama visited Argentina today. Uh, it was kind of a slap in the face for the people there because he did it on the very day, the anniversary of the dirty war that the United States was behind many years ago. Now, he kind of did it because he's trying to show their way of apologizing for it, but it was still perceived by the people there as a slap in the face that he would come on that particular day. BBC March 24, 2016 says Argentina, Obama visits Dirty War Memorial on coup anniversary. Uh, this is when the United States, by the way, was uh, wanting to overthrow Argentina's government there. They successfully did that. Uh, but the coup that they used to overthrow it ended up really brutalizing their own people. The article here says the U.S. was too slow to stand up for human rights in Argentina. This is being quoted, they're quoting President Obama. Uh, and some 30,000 people are estimated to have been killed during the six years of military government. Thousands of other people were illegally detained and tortured in what became known as the Dirty War. That's a that's very, very much right. Continuing on in here, there were definitely, there were protesters out against him coming uh, because of what the United States did in, in supporting this coup to overthrow the government. CIA very heavily involved in this. Anyway, it goes on. There's been controversy about the policies of the United States early on those dark days. And the United States, when it reflects on what happened here, has to examine its own policies as well. Its own past, Obama says here. Democracies have to have the courage to acknowledge when we don't live up to the ideals that we stand for, when we've been slow to stand up for human rights, and that was the case here. Well, it's also the case right now with the Kurds over in the Middle East, but we don't want to upset Turkey, do we? Because they are our ally, and we got to stand with our ally. Unless it's Israel, of course. Don't stand with Israel, because the Palestinians are our real ally as far as the United States is concerned, and but that's not, though, the Christian people, the believers in the United States, we know that they do stand with Israel. And God bless you for doing, making that stand. Now, let's take a look. We're going to go into the prophecies now. Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 6 is where I want to start at. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through, to, uh, march through the breath of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Our nation started off exactly that way. And if I would have really taken the time to go into the genocide that we did to the American Indians in order to take this land that was not ours in the first place. Now, this is also looking at it as a global prophecy, not just in historical of the United States, but it, it was it's a stain on the American flag. Uh, there is two different estimates. One says 100 million. I, I kind of lean more to the 10 million plus estimated number of Native Americans living in land that is now the United States when European explorers first arrived in the 15th century, less than 300,000 estimated number of Native Americans living in the United States around 1900. So that many Indians were killed, 10 mil, over 10 million of them. Uh, this is, was on the website uh, endgenocide.org, United to End Genocide. Uh, one of the photos there of, that I just pulled off the internet. <clears throat> Continuing on, also uh, notice, as, as Habakkuk says, to possess the dwelling places that, that, that are not theirs. Uh, the photo here is Sitting Bull refused to order his people to stop dancing. Uh, and in consequence, was arrested and killed in an act that led two weeks later to the infamous massacre at Wood Wounded Knee, where 150 through Sioux, 53 Sioux Indians, mostly women and children, were needlessly slaughtered. 
by the United States Army. And this here is a photograph that was taken back then of the U.S. Army. Uh, and of course, reminiscent of the Holocaust in, in Germany, they've dug deep, deep ditches and throw the bodies into. Uh, and that wasn't the first time. This happened many, many times and even since then. Let's continue on looking at the prophecies though. Vietnam War is just one case of many here, but anyway, it says in Habakkuk 1, 7, 8, and 9, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed, uh, uh, proceed of themselves. Their horses are also swifter than the leopards and more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come uh, from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Um, and, and I think that is reminiscent of war planes and things like that as the nation developed. Anyway, verse 9, They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And the war the crimes that, that even we have committed as a nation uh, in battle, uh, and it, it doesn't make us you know, better or not better. There, there's been wars that America did participate in that were good. Uh, and of course, the, in Germany, the liberation of the Jewish people from the Holocaust camps is definitely one of those, uh, which reminds me, the, the photograph you're seeing here are German prisoners, prisoners of war there. Notice what it says though in the prophecy, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. Okay. And that is one of the largest POW camps ever the United States had in war there. And there's no telling how many were there. Uh, but anyway, it says, uh, World War II, Europe's Germany, German POWs captured by American airborne troops in Rura. Uh, and we just made a note there. Granted, the Germans did deserve it, which is very true. They, you know, they, they, they needed to be captured, and that needed to be stopped. But our country, uh, the United States, as much as I love our country, we have been known to topple and overthrow perfectly legitimate governments that were never bothering us in the first place. Uh, anyway, let's continue on, though, with the prophecy that Habakkuk does here. In chapter 1, verse 10, says, And they shall scoff at the kings and the princes, and shall be scorned unto them, and they shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Uh, then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Now, George Bush, in an article entitled, God Told Me to End the Tyranny in Iraq, from The Guardian on October the 7th of 2005, is when this was taken right there. And some people might say, you know, he's a Christian man. All right? I, I can appreciate that. But when you go to saying God has told you something and that God has told you to do certain things, let's look at what God told him to do. This is one of the statements here. Now remember what Habakkuk says in verse 11. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. All right. One of the delegates, Nabal Shatah, who was a Palestinian foreign minister at the time, said, President Bush said to all of us, I am driven with a mission from God. God would tell me, George, go and fight these terrorists in Afghanistan. And I did. Then God would tell me, George, go and end the tyranny in Iraq. And I did. Mr. Bush went on, and now again I feel God's words coming to me, Go get the Palestinians their state and get the Israelis their security and get peace in the Middle East. And by God, I'm going to do it. That's a direct contradiction to what God would say. God speaks about in the book of Joel that he will bring judgment upon those that are dividing his land. So what God is telling him to go and give the Palestinians a state. Now, did you notice in his own statement, it doesn't say go get the Palestinians their state and the Israelis their state. It says go get the Palestinians their state and get the Israelis their security. That's kind of an interesting statement right there, especially in light of Psalm 83 verse 4, where they say that let's come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no longer be remembered. Something to think about, isn't it? 
So the prophecy definitely coming to pass. Let's look at verses 12 and 13. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God? See, now, now the prophet is talking to the Lord, and he's going to speak to the Lord about the judgment of this nation that's doing this. Because notice what, what he's done. He's, now he's, he's touching the apple of God's eye. George Bush was touching the apple of God's eye by, by, by being willing to divide the land of Israel. So... When, when Habakkuk notes that about whatever this leader of this uh, Chaldean nation would be, this is what Habakkuk answers. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art pure eyes and to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Oh my gosh, friends, do you realize how powerful that statement is right there? I mean, notice though, Habakkuk begins to cry out to the Lord when that man there that claims that he is being led by his God... See, he makes a big change. Now he's saying that God is telling him to do it. And then we see George Bush says, and now again, I feel God's word came to me, coming to me, go, go get the Palestinians their state and get the Israelis their security. That's not God. That's not the God of Israel saying that. The God of Israel would never say, go part my land. My goodness, man. John Stockwell, who was a former CIA director of operations, he made this statement here. He's made many. If you've not listened to any of his uh, interviews, it would be a really good idea for you to do that. The CIA, he says here, with its related institutions, is, ex is exposed as an agency of destabilization of repre and repression. Through its history, it has organized secret wars that killed millions of people in the third world who had no capability of doing physical harm to the United States. It's quoted by John Stockwell, ex-CIA officer and U.S. dissident. Now, watch what it says as we continue on. Verses 14 through 17. And make us men as the fishes of the sea and the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice into their net and burn incense into their drag, because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Sure, the United States is a very wealthy nation, always has been, but not by our own. Okay? And that's what it's that's what it's saying there. You just gotta watch the wording, it's very interesting. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? I mean, granted, we are the military arm, as the United States, we are the military arm for the Vatican. And by the way, there is a prophecy in Jeremiah that speaks of us being the daughter of Babylon. The Chaldeans are the daughter of Babylon. So it, there is a prophecy that directly links the Chaldeans of Habakkuk to Babylon, in this case, Mystery Babylon, and yes, the United States is a daughter of Rome. In fact, our history was totally rewritten. We are still a British uh, empire under the direct control of the Pope of Rome. That is, I mean, there's, that's debatable. And okay, now, so I'm not going to, I don't want to just make you guys all upset to hear that. But there is a, a lot of support that shows that, that the United States is not, uh, or their history has been rewritten. Um, I can't verify that yay or nay myself. I've not studied in that direction there, but, uh, but it is something to think about for sure. Let's go on into chapter 2, and we'll be concluding here just momentarily. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. And make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So see, this was not dealing with 
perhaps the Chaldeans that Ezekiel was speaking about or, or other Chaldeans in, in different places in the Bible that we have because there's a lot of different places where it speaks of the Chaldeans. This was a prophecy dealing for a future generation long after the time of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, right? So maybe we're descendants of some of these people as far as the Americans. I, I don't know. Don't know. I don't know what that connection is or is it a spiritual connection? All right, verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. That's because there's going to be believers in the nation. This nation is going to have true believers that will live by faith. Yea, also because he transgresseth, transgresseth, transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell and as, a, and as, as death cannot be satisfied. He gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him, uh, unto him all people. Interesting, isn't it? Now, I want you to see if you catch something here. Notice what it said in there. Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man. Now, when we look here at President uh, Franklin Roosevelt, it's not that Franklin Roosevelt was a proud man, unless you guys know something that I'm not aware of, but it's re regarding the nation itself as a proud man. Now, let's, let's go back and see. Why does it say he transgresseth by wine? Well, the United States was not founded as a, a nation that didn't uh, allow wine and beer. But it became that way. Prohibition in the United States was a nationwide constitutional ban on the, on the sale of the product, production, importation, and the transportation of alcoholic beverages that remained in place from 1920 to 1933. It was promoted by the Social, Progressive, and the Democratic and Republican parties. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, excuse, promoted by the Dry Crusaders and a movement led by rural Protestants and Social Progressives in the Democratic and Republican parties and was coordinated by the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Prohibition was mandated under the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution. All right? So notice, yea, also because he transgresseth by wine. So it was what? It was the Christian people pushing for this. They got it enacted into law. All right, then on March 22nd, 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the, the Cool and Harrison Act, legalizing beer and alcohol content of 3.2% by weight and wine of a similar low alcoholic content on December 5th, 1993, ratification of the 21st Amendment, repealed the 18th Amendment. So again, little hints of these prophecies that tell us it's the United States in prophecy. Now, let's go on further. Let's go to verse 6. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long to him that ladeth himself with thick clay? Now, actually the Hebrew word here, avitit, is not the word clay. It literally means a pledged of goods. You know, like like. Like if you're going to pawn something or you're going to get a loan on a debt uh, and you're, you're bringing something to, to a collateral to secure that loan. That's what uh, avitit, avi, avitit, actually, excuse me, avitit is actually the word here in Hebrew. That's what that word means. It's not the word thick clay in this case here. It can be done figuratively like that. That's why the King James Version translates it. But if you looked at the New American Standard uh, uh, Version Bible there, they translated it a little bit better. That last part where it says, How long and to him that ladeth himself with the clay, they translate that, make himself rich with loans. That's more the correct way. See, so woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. In other words, he's getting a lot of money, but he's not doing it. Not, not of himself. Makes himself rich with loans. In other words, he gets that money by using collateral. I wonder what the collateral is for the United States. Well, our total U.S. debt surpasses $19 trillion, rises $8.4 trillion under President Obama thus far, and of course, rising daily like, just like nuts. Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 7, shall, shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake 
uh, that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them. Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that, that uh, dwell therein, woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be de uh, delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people, and hast sinned against thy soul. Oh my gosh, friends, do you realize, I mean, the evils that our country has done in order to be wealthy? Even in the Middle East, what did we do? Why did we really go to war in Iraq? We didn't go there to liberate the Kurds. If we did, we'd still be fighting for the Kurds today, and we wouldn't allow the Turkish people just to go out there and obliterate them. We didn't go there for that reason. We went there to secure the oil-rich region there for the American standard of living. I mean, granted, friends, we have prospered very well in America as, as people. Even the poorest people in America have prospered very well. You know, because why? Our nation has done so much evil. We have, we've amassed a wealth based on nothing but loans. Even when I was a young man, I made this statement to my mother one time. I said, you know, Mom, I said, our whole nation is built on nothing but debts. And I said, just like a guy that gets, gets a lot of credit but can't pay the debt back, I said, eventually he goes bankrupt. I said, somewhere along the line, our nation's got to go bankrupt. I said this like at about 18, 19 years old. Already recognizing that then. Now, but notice what it says here. Who owns the, uh, excuse me, uh, back up real quick. They uh, sh uh, Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, and of the city, and all that dwell therein. You see, now this is going to be a compound fulfillment, friends. It's not just going to be the United States, because remember, the mother of the United States is Rome. She's going to go down right with it. She is the mystery Babylon that sits on many waters. But in this case here, the United States is being directly implicated in the prophecy. And who are those many nations? Well, who owns the U.S. national debt? We know that China is the largest. They just surpassed Britain, by the way. I didn't put Britain in here, but Britain owns a heck of a lot of our debt as well. But it says China is the largest holder holding the one2 Four six trillion in December of 2015. By the way, the largest debt holder of our national debt is the American people, and all we do is borrow as well. You know, very few people are uh, what would you call it um, debt free. The oil exporting countries are fourth holding, two uh, two hundred ninety two point five billion. That's Brazil is in fifth. And notice, the oil exporting countries are fourth holding. They, they're the fourth in line of holding our debt. Japan, by the way, also is in there. They're the second, second highest oil exporting countries. That's your Middle Eastern countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran even. Don't forget Iran. We owe Iran a huge amount of money that we froze their assets uh, when the United States went against them. Do you think that we can continue to rob from these different countries? And I'm definitely not a supporter of Iran, okay? So don't get me wrong here. I don't like Iran because Iran doesn't like Israel, so me and Iran ain't going to get along. I can tell you that right now. But it's still not right of, of, of the American uh, government to take and just freeze up all their money. You know, that's like your neighbor comes and robs you, takes all your money and puts it in his bank account. And he says, you know, until you come over here and mow my grass for me, buddy, uh, you're not going to get it back. That ain't going to work. Okay? And this is what the United States has done with, with several nations that, that they don't get along with. You don't think those nations aren't going to turn on us eventually? Not to mention all the ones that we owe money to. Look at, look at Germany. Germany wanted their gold that was in the U.S. vaults. What did the U.S. say? Well, I'm sorry, you can't get that until 2020. How can we just tell them, you're not getting your own gold that we're holding for you? It's because we don't have it. That's why. Anyway, so you can go on and look at this. Brazil is the fifth. 254.8 billion of our debt they hold. Switzerland, U.K., Hong Kong, Taiwan, India, all of these, 1.1 trillion in debt they own combined. 
And then according to RT News, now that, that one was, I forget what, that was on, uh, I think Wikipedia is where I got, no, 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 it was actually on a website, I apologize, I don't normally use Wikipedia for anything, uh, very little anyway. Uh, but RT.com said Russia held U.S. Treasury bills worth $66.5 billion as of April this year. That was in 2015, though, by the way. So what do you think is going to happen then? Well, China being the main one, Russia having a significant amount of debt as well that they're holding, they both have issues with the United States. So does Iran, has issue with our country, and so does uh, North Korea, and we even have frozen assets of North Korea. I mean, it's, it's, it's nuts, not to mention the Middle East. You don't think they're not going to turn on us? I'm telling you, eventually, that's what's going to happen to our country. They're going to get tired of waiting, knowing that they can't get paid back. Well, they might as well just take the country. I'm sure they would rather do it without a nuclear war. They'd rather just take the country. Like they say about China, they say we sold off uh, all the, you know, China owns practically all the mortgage companies in the United States now. That was the only way to be able to pay their debt off. In fact, why do you think that we had in the United States, and this was a friend of mine that was a, that's, that is a major banker in the United States, or with a major bank, I should say, Chase uh, Manhattan. He reminded me, he says, you remember how that Obama did this uh, cars for cash deal? It didn't matter what your car was, bring it in, drag it in, whatever. They're going to give you $5,000 for your car, and you're going to be guaranteed to get a finance or whatever. I forget how that thing was, how it worked. But anyway, Obama did this plan. He said the reason why they did it was China was demanding money, and the only way the United States could satisfy this debt was to give them raw steel in exchange for helping pay off part of that debt that we owed to them, or at least make a... a a interest payment on it. And so this is what the cash for clunkers was all about. It was in order to be able to get up a bunch of steel to send it to China to kind of cool them down so that they didn't just get all mega angry. You know, the only thing that America has going for it is the fact that they're a military superpower. But eventually, as Habakkuk has prophesied, they're going to get tired of it. Oh gosh, friends. Anyway, by the way, friends, we do de do definitely need your help in keeping this broadcast going. Consider giving to this ministry, this prophetic ministry. You can go to IsraeliNewsLive.org, just as you see on your screen here, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Uh, you can contribute there online, securely and safely there, any kind of credit card whatsoever. Or go to IsraelReturns.com, and there we have under our contact page there, we have our mailing address as well. Uh, and we will be updating our mailing address very soon because we're going to use a post office box uh, because we will be moving from our house that we're in before too long. So we're going to be updating that. I will be sending out information for those of you that do mail things to us. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for standing with us here. And uh, be blessed. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Shalom.